Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Um, session number three, and um, looking at uh, our topic of we were made for this, and exploring who we are as Adventists. During the first session, I asked the question: Is the only reason we're here just for cornflakes? Is that the only mark that we are supposed to leave on this world? Um, and throughout the rest of this week, I'm trying to answer that question, and hopefully, the answer is no. We were made for something much, much more than that. Um, yesterday I looked at what it is that we believe as Adventists that separates us from everybody else, the reason that we exist as a, as a people, and doctrinally I believe that the, the thing that really separates us is the sanctuary. That's something that is special as an Adventist belief. Um, but today I'd like to ask the other side of the question, is what is it that brings us together? What is it that makes us the same? Um, because although we are, we do have a unique view on some things, and um, we also share a lot of views um, with, well, let's see, um, who do we share views with? And I have four um, examples. These are just examples. We have other things that we believe that are also shared. But these are four very common examples where we can find points of common ground with many people around us. Um, so, shall we open with a prayer and then let's dive straight in. I was kind of righteous, Father in heaven. I ask that you'd be with us now throughout this discussion um, this evening, as we as we look at what it is that brings us together. What is it that we have in common with other groups around us? Um, may you bless this tonight. Bless um, bless my words. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So the first thing, and I'm going to ask, it's probably the biggest. It is it is the biggest one. Um, it's one of the things that is, although um, the sanctuary is something that makes us unique as Adventists, this is a thing that makes us um, makes us Christian, um, and that's grace. Um, without grace, we don't get very far. Um, in fact, we don't get anywhere at all. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a sermon I watched once. Um, a well commencement speech. Um, was a professor at a university in the US, uh, not an Adventist university, um, but he said he would talk with his with his students and he would um, basically put up a, a line on the, on the you know, this big blackboard you get in lecture theatres and he goes, here's you as a sinner and here's Jesus as 100% perfect. And he'd ask the students, kind of like his chalk, where on that line do you meet Jesus? Um, where does Jesus meet you on that line? And kind of some of the more humble ones would say, well, I'm somewhere back here, kind of just a little bit in. Some of the more arrogant ones maybe put, maybe even as far as halfway um, across. And then he would tell them that everybody was wrong, um, that Jesus meets us right back here as sinners. There is nothing that we do um, that has anything to do with our salvation. Um, Perhaps if we have a look at Ephesians chapter 2, um, this might make that a little bit clearer. Um, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus, and then verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of, his, um, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So. Our salvation is something that we have absolutely nothing to do with. It's something that Jesus has done for us. It's a gift. Um, we, there is nothing, we can't work harder to earn our salvation. We can't work harder to make Jesus love us more. Um, we can't do anything to, to, to help the situation. Um, it all happens, well, for us long before we were born. Um, so the question kind of I'll get into the second part of the question of what happens next in a minute, but um, the idea of grace being, it is the central thing that, that we have as, as Christians. Without grace, we have nothing. And I'm sure many of you have studied, um, anybody who's been in the Adventist Church for any amount of time will have seen um, discussions on grace and how grace is not a, it's not a New Testament concept. It's not a concept that only came around with Jesus, something that has been around right from the very, very beginning. Um, uh, the writers of the Hebrews very clear in Hebrews 11 that all of these great men of um, the great men of the Old Testament they all were did what they were by faith by faith Abraham by faith Moses and and so on and so forth um, 
So without faith we can't get anywhere. The only part we have in this whole discussion of salvation is to accept it. Um, and that for me, it is, it's not the core thing that makes us Adventists, but it's the core thing that makes us Christians. Um, and by saying that, that should already give you a, a hint at least of who we have this in common with. Because we are not the only church that believes in grace, um, funnily enough. Um, there are actually, the vast majority of churches believe in grace, um, that we are saved by grace. Um, the entire of Protestantism um, believes that, um, with a few very small exceptions. But the entire of Protestantism believes that, and then um, nowadays most, most Catholics um, will do something in the, the Western world, maybe more traditional places, not so much. Um, <clears throat> but it is still a very um, believable thing that everybody, that all of these, these people have in common. Um, so salvation by grace is, it is fundamental to who we are as, as people, um, as Christians, as, as Adventists. We cannot escape it in anything we do. And everything we have has to point back to, to Jesus and the cross and, and grace. Um, you'll see yesterday looking at the, the sanctuary as being the thing that makes us unique as, Christ, as, as Adventists. Actually it informs us more about grace, and um, that's what it does. It tells us and explains a deeper understanding of grace than we might otherwise have. Um, so grace, you can't take grace away from anything, and grace is going to pop up um, several more times during this week, um, as it is something that is very, very important to what we're going to be looking at starting tomorrow. Um, so that's part number one. Part number two um, of things that we have in common is the law. Because we'll, when we look at the law and the idea that God has an ideal for us, and He has uh, a desire for us, then we understand that once we are saved, there is a next phase. Um, the next phase being that now you're saved, here's how you should be living. This is what you should be working towards. Um, and before salvation, the law points us, it points out our, our mistakes, it accuses us and points us to Jesus. Um, you can look through the law as um, they did in the time of Josiah or they did in the time of Ezra. Um, they read the law and they, they wept um, because they saw of all the things that they've abandoned God. Um, the, in their case they didn't even realize that they'd, they'd done. Um, and it's the same for us, many of us we don't realize we're doing things until we see it in the law and then we go, oh, I didn't realize it wasn't supposed to be like that, um, I'm very, very sorry. And it's that very, very sorry, that's where grace comes in. But then after we're saved, it tells you how you should live. And it's like, okay, so somebody who's been saved shouldn't be killing, somebody who's saved shouldn't be lying, shouldn't be committing adultery, shouldn't be doing this, 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 this. And as you go through, you see all the different things that somebody who's saved should and shouldn't be doing. Because uh, it's, it's not just the negative, it's also I should be doing this, and it's like, oh, I'm not doing that. Um, and there's a, a, a lot of very, very good information, a lot of fantastic principles in the law that help us to um, understand where we should be in our lives. Um, so let's have a look, Romans 3, um, Romans chapter 3. So Romans, um, together with Galatians, is where, of course, Martin Luther, 400 years ago, um, he found grace and he rediscovered grace and started the whole Protestant Reformation um, based on that. Um, so let's read from verse 21 of Romans chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in, Je in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time, so that He might be just, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, so exactly the same as we're looking at, we're saved by, by grace, by faith. There is nothing that we have to do that. It's what God has done for us. It's not about us being good, it's about God being good. It's about God being kind and loving and doing things for us, which we can't do for ourselves. Um, it says, there is no distinction, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
nobody is able to do this on their own. Nobody has ever done this on their own except Jesus. <coughs> so then in verse 27 he asks, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. I mean, by what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. You're justified separate from the works. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, also to the Gentiles also, since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So the circumcised, which was the Jews that um, he was talking to, and then the uncircumcised, which was everybody else he was talking to, uh, both, um, they're both justified by faith. Uh, they're both saved by faith with made right and fixed by faith. So then verse 31 is kind of the, the key I'd like to look at now. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So as Adventists, we have a different view on the law to most Protestants um, who think the law, at least in part, was done away with. Um, we believe that the law was upheld. Um, because without the law having been there, there was no need for Jesus to have died on the cross. If the law was changeable, he could have just changed the law instead of having to die for us. Um, so the law is still valid, and we still need the, the law is still the the bar that is set for, for for being right with God, for having that relationship, for being for able to be in contact with God. Because sin can't be in contact with God. Um, so that being the case, we know where we're, where we're looking for, and that becomes the work of what we call sanctification. It's the work of the rest of your life. Um, and it's something that will only be completed when Jesus comes back. And there is, it's a, a constant, um, constant work for us, um, a constant part of us, but it's, again, it's not our work, it's the Holy Spirit living in us, working, um, making good works in us. It's the love of Jesus reflecting in our lives and us responding to his love that he um, he started it, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. Um, he's the one who, who is bringing us out. He's the one who's, who's drawing us um, drawing us to himself. Um, now with the law, I said there's the more conservative end of Catholicism is still very much this idea we have to keep the law and it's um, very clear on, on, on sin, um, a lot of emphasis on sin. So that's um, we have a lot in common with, with Catholics, which we have a lot in common with Jews who still hold exactly the same law today. Um, and even then it also will reflect a lot on a lot of people who are looking this kind of modern culture we have of um, if you do these five things then you will be successful and um, it's kind of like here are the rules Th this this is the way life is supposed to look and um, for them it's kind of a yacht and a uh, the, the, the the fancy cars and all of this thing but for us it's having that relationship with God and there are points of common ground there that we can that we can draw on when we're talking to people so between grace and the law, um, that covers all of Judaism and all of Christianity, um, plus a lot of other people as well. So what we should call that an even three billion, um, two and a half billion Christians plus maybe half a billion others. Does that sound fair? Okay, let's, let's, let's call it three billion just to make the numbers nice and round. So that's not far off half the world's population just with those two things um, where we have direct things in common that's not even about whether they want to hear about grace that's just they already have grace or they already have the law um, or some some version of it which we can build on <coughs> um, then the third part is is prophecy um, prophecy is a really interesting one um, for us as Adventists, that's, prophecy has been one of the traditional ways of outreach that we've had. We show up somewhere, we pitch a tent, and we throw Daniel and Revelation seminars. Um, there were uh, stories of people uh, going around with these massive papier-mâché models of the, the statue from Daniel chapter 2. Um, and you, you see photos of, of old evangelists with um, kind of having actually models of the, 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 the beasts from, from, from Revelation and, and, and Daniel 7 and um, that's really quite uh, uh, ingenious what they, what they used to do with these and then today we still do Daniel Revelation seminars today maybe not so much as we used to um, I led one in our church three years ago I think it was um, uh, where we looked at uh, the prophecies of Daniel Revelation um, it's something that we do on a fairly regular basis still um, 
and it's important because it gives us hope because prophecy is not there for us to be able to guess what the future is um, that's not the point of prophecy um, the point of prophecy is so that we might have faith um, so that when things do happen we might believe and as we're warning the world about what's going to happen um, and well i'm not recording this in the church i'm at my house <laughs> um, we're on lockdown um, a kind of nationwide lockdown at the moment so you can see that these things are little blips here and there um, <clears throat> they see uh, in the um, in the news referring to biblical level um, plagues going on so we have this pandemic we have the plagues of locust we have um, the the wildfires that they were in Australia at the beginning of the year and they refer to them as biblical and it's, well, it's gonna get a lot worse than this um, but there's hope because even though it's going to get worse than this, if you choose to be on God's side, it just gets better and better and better. Um, and so we have this message of hope for a, for a hurting world. That is something that a lot of people want to hear right now. Um, based on what God has already done and the, the things he's, he already does for us and has, has done throughout history, and you can see that in, in the prophecies, and then just, just a little bit at the end, which we're going to talk more about in a, couple, in a few days' time. So there's a little bit at the end, which we need to believe is going to happen. And ultimately, it's Jesus coming again is, is where things are headed. Um, and that's the good news. That's, that's the best bit, because then we get eternity, um, where everything that happens on this world is going to be... It's going to pale into insignificance. Whatever however bad things are here, where it's going to look, seem as a, a minor thing there, because we're going to be looking at eternity, um, and that's just going to be so much better than anything we can look at here. <clears throat> but there is something specific I want to talk about with prophecy as well. It does have um, an outreach. So let's read um, Rom um, Revelation 19. Not much prophecy in Romans. Um, Revelation 19. Let's have a look here, over the page. There we go. So, if we read from verse 11 down to 16 of Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on earth is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he, ma he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <coughs> this imagery here of Jesus coming back as the conquering king, um, we think of this as, obviously this is something Adventists emphasize a lot, this is something that many Christians will use to talk about, for most people, quite a, a distant second coming. Um, this, this image of Jesus coming back on a white horse as the, the, the conquering hero. Um, but it's not just Christians. Um, when I was at university I lived with a, uh, a Muslim, um, a friend of mine, and it was interesting talking with him and understanding about um, Muslim prophecy. You may not know this, but Muslims are actually quite, um, they, they, they put quite a lot of emphasis on prophecy. Um, they have quite a lot about um, eschatology, looking at the time of the end, and for them Jesus is the one, because Jesus is the, the biggest prophet, he's not, the last prophet was Muhammad, but Jesus was the biggest prophet and Jesus is going to come back again. Um, he's going to lead um, the, the saints, um, I can't think of the right word at the moment, but he's, he's going to lead the, 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 the faithful um, <clears throat> um, to set up the everlasting caliphate here on earth. Um, so they see Jesus coming back as a conquering hero and that being the end of the uh, sinful world we live in as well. So even there, there's a lot of there's a lot of commonality that we can that we can pull on. Um, I remember uh, a few years ago seeing um, uh, Pastor Petrus Bahadur um, uh, preaching, and he's one of our pastors in America. I'll see if I can um, find a, a video um, uh, to, to, to link below for you. But he's um, uh, 
it was very, very interesting because on the Sabbath morning um, he preached from the Bible, he preached about Islam and about, um, about the Arabs and about um, the, the, the importance and kind of how they, they, they fit into the big story, which was um, interesting stuff I had not seen before. And then on the Sabbath afternoon he preached Christianity from the Quran, um, which was really interesting. Um, now I knew um, Sabbath is in the Quran, for example, it's in uh, Surah 4. It talks about the Sabbath and the importance of keeping the Sabbath. Um, but then he preached about the virgin birth, he preached about the second coming, he preached about um, grace, he preached about so many, he kind of pulled out so many of the things that we believe from the Quran. Um, so there is commonality we have with, with Islam as well, which we can build on. Um, which again, very, very interesting to think about this. Um, so if we think of grace and the law, we already got to about three billion. Um, we can add another two billion um, Muslims onto that um, with, with the idea of prophecy, besides how many we think might be interested in, in hope in this troubled time. Um, we're easily at five billion by now, uh, maybe even more. Um, that's already a good portion of the world's population. <laughs> Well, I think we can we can get all the way um, if we if we keep going. Shall we try number four? Um, number four that I had on my list um, is the health message. Um, the idea of temperance, the idea of uh, of being healthy, and you think of how that resonates with the world that we're in today. Um, because we're in a world that is putting a lot of emphasis at the moment on veganism, um, on healthier diets, on living better. You see the the popularity at the moment of P with Joe Wicks um, every morning at nine o'clock and you can join in, you can be there in your living room and you can be getting healthy. Um, and the number of people who are healthier in lockdown than they've ever been in their lives. Um, also a lot of people overeating as well, so there's both sides needs to be, we, we have something that we can, we can help them with and we can reach. Um, uh, for our family we started in um, uh, in January we decided we were going to um, be vegetarian um, completely um, and then even the last couple of months we've been pretty much vegan um, making my own cheese um, all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of things like that to try and um, make our lives better which is made so much easier by the wealth of information there is on well YouTube let's, let's face most of it's on YouTube and uh, that we watch so we get recipes and how to's and you don't have to miss out on anything. Um, the vegan foods we've been making over the last few weeks have been great, um, at least as good as what we've been what we were eating before. Um, when we were merely flexitarians. Um, so it's uh, one thing, and the good thing is, I feel better. I feel stronger and fitter and healthier and clearer. Um, so that's that, that, that's good and that's why kind of the Adventist message it's a whole it's the, the complete body I mean you have the, the new start program which you can have a link below <coughs> fantastic um, <coughs> a fantastic tool to help people to be um, healthier to help people to um, to live better lives um, and it's something that we can use and we can share and then they get to the tea, the, the, the tea at the very end understand trusting God and that's where we, we can come in a bit more um, uh, uh, so it's, it's an acronym for those who haven't seen it I'll, so I'll put the link below um, it's a very, very good program um, to look at so with all of these things together that's, um, that's kind of a, a huge number of people that we can reach um, uh, what's the, if we have a look at 1 Corinthians 10 um, for the uh, a verse on this, it's always flips the trouble with having stuff stuck in your Bible, is it? it jumps massive, um, massive amounts all at once. Um, so after he's been, uh, Paul has been talking to the church in Corinth, and uh, there's been arguments about whether or not we should eat food offered to idols and, and this kind of thing. And then in verse 31 of First Corinthians 10, it says, "So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God." See, in everything we do, we have to do it for the honor and glory of God. So we can start um, when we look at the, the health laws of um, Leviticus 11, for example, and again repeats in Deuteronomy and. Um, of the clean and unclean meats that really resonates with, with, with Muslims there were many Muslim friends I, um, I've had who have been ecstatic when I mentioned yeah I don't eat pork um, and I'm like wow that's amazing 
um, and it becomes a real point of friendship and camaraderie with them, which is, um, I really like that. And then um, you see today kind of modern vegans, um, Buddhists, um, so many others who value life and you can see the, the the, the impact we have on, in our health message and the respect for, for nature, the respect for, um, respect for our bodies, um, the, the, the health um, benefits of it, all of these things kind of are, it's part of our message, it's part of who we've been for well over, what it was the 1850s when Ellen White and the, she started to push the idea of the health message as being important to us. Um, and something we should pay attention to. Um, so when you look at this whole uh, this whole picture um, between these four things, I believe that adds up to the seven and whatever billion people that we have on this planet today. We just with these four things we can touch everybody. We'll have something to do with one of these four things. Now, why is this important? Tomorrow we're going to start looking at um, Revelation chapter 14. We're going to spend three days looking at the three angels' messages, which I think is it's why we're here at the moment. Um, anyway, it's because of the three angels' messages. And that's what I'm going to propose. Um, so I'm going to go through each one of those, and we'll see what the message is, what that means, what we are supposed to be doing. Um, <clears throat> but having understanding what we're doing needs to come from an idea of what we believe. And what we believe are these these things. We believe in the sanctuary, we believe in grace, we believe in the law, we believe in prophecy, we believe in the health message, we believe in many other things as well. But these kind of are who we are. And then tomorrow we're going to start looking at what we can do with them. Now, the reason I've split it out like this and said what makes us different yesterday and then what makes us the same today Particularly the things what makes us the same. There was a very interesting series, um, I'll put the link below for um, the uh, a, a series of sermons by one of our um, academics from the US, a guy called Dr. John Pauline. Um, uh, he's one of our, uh, he's a New Testament expert. Um, uh, reading one of his books at the moment, which is um, beautiful. Um, and he, he puts forward the um, this, he, he discusses the idea of remnant um, and he puts forward the idea that when we come to the end um, he goes into some detail, when we come to the very end the remnant doesn't kind of the when we come to the very end there are two groups there are those who follow God's law and those who follow man um, and many Adventists are going to jump ship and follow man um, with the pressure that it's going to be people who call themselves Adventists today so it's not that we're saved or we're perfect or anything like that please don't get me wrong but the nucleus of what we believe that's where everyone else is going to coalesce around and there are going to be so many more coming in that are going out and um, the, uh, the the fundamental of what we believe is going to be um, it's going to be picked up by a lot of people and what he puts forward is that actually what we believe sits right there in the middle of what everyone else believes. Um, so we have things in common with this group, we have things in common with this group, we have things in common with this group, so that when they have to make the choice, they can say, well, actually, I agree with that. Um, and so they look at the rest of what we believe and go, hmm, or I agree with that. And so then they look at the rest of what we believe and go, hmm. And it opens the door because we have this commonality with well, everybody. Um, and that is a, a powerful witnessing tool for us. It's a powerful place and it can only be God-led um, that we find ourselves in the position and with our, uh, our doctrinal beliefs being right in the center of everybody's. And everybody has something that they can, they can come to us with and, um, and make a start from. So, we're going to look at the three angels' messages over the next three days, um, over the next th uh, three evenings we're going to have together. But in the meantime, before we get to the bigger picture of what we as a church are supposed to be doing, I'd like you to think about what you're doing um, and think about the people that you're in contact with um, on a daily basis. Maybe not quite a daily basis at the moment, um, but once things calm down, people that you're regularly in contact with the family that lives next door to you. What do you have in common with them? 
um, where can you start the conversation with them? Uh, how about the, the, the guy who sits next to you at work or the friends you, you have at school or, or wherever it is you find yourselves? What is it you have in common with these people? Because the commonality is something that we can build on um, when we're trying to show people and bring people to Jesus. Um, <clears throat> or to a fuller understanding of Jesus if they already have some understanding of him. Um, it's a powerful way of thinking about the people around us because we know what we have in common with them. You see Jesus doing this all the time. Well, what do we have in common with them? Well, they like to eat. <laughs> he wants to be healed. Um, and he goes through kind of the health message. He goes through um, uh, money. He goes through all of these different questions that are real and living things for people and with just these four things that I mentioned today we can talk about things that are living and real for people who we meet on a regular basis. So I'd like you to, to think about that and, uh, and, and then tomorrow we're going to expand on that and move into the first angel's message. Look, what is it that we as a, a church are supposed to be doing um, now? And let's ask the question, are we doing that? Um, are we doing it as we should? So um, I'll leave you there for now. Um, God bless. Father in heaven, we thank you um, for this message we have that we know that even though we are different from everyone around us, we also have so much in common. Um, points of contact that we have with, with, those we, with those we see, with those we talk to, where we can help to open the conversation and bring people to you. That using these things we can, make pe we can help people to understand the uh, the joy and wonder that there is in following you, of knowing you, of feeling your love and knowing your forgiveness in our lives. Dear Jesus, we're so thankful that you have, you have shown us these things, that you have left these truths for, for, for these final generations, that as people who are here now are, are suffering, that they may, through these things and others, through, through us, through your Holy Spirit working through us, they may come to know you. Dear Jesus, we ask that you'll please be with us now. Amen.